Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we're gonna paint this guitar man, but before we get into it, I wanna let you know that for the next two days, I am having a birthday sale in my teachable school. I'm 46 today, and so you can save 46% off the class of your choice. If you go to lindsaywyrick.teachable.com, pick out your classes, and then when you check out, click add coupon and type in HB46, you will save 46% off of your class. So um, thank you so much for supporting my channel, my work. I really appreciate it. So now let's get into our tutorial today. We are going to draw this guitar man and there's actually a real-time version of this lesson up in Critique Club, my membership class over on my teachable school. And um, that will go through step by step. It's about two hours, just under two hours of content there. But we're going to go through it in time lapse so you can see how this expressive portrait comes to life. I've been following the World Watercolor Month Challenge for the month of July. It's one of the challenges I try to do every year. And uh, today's prompt was perform, and I thought it'd be fun to do a musician. And I found this reference photo on Unsplash, and I just really love the gesture of this guitar player. And I thought it would be really fun to sketch. And I'm sketching with a cerulean blue watercolor crayon. It's one of the um, watercolor sticks by American Journey that's sold at Cheap Joe's. and. Um, I just decided I would try these because I haven't used them in a while and they do dilute really well, more like a watercolor, but you could use whatever watercolor crayons or even watercolor pencils you have. It would all work just fine. In fact, I thought it'd be fun to get some watercolor crayons into this piece because I want to give the Stabilo Woody 3-in-1 crayons another go and I thought it would be nice for some highlights later on down the road, but um, I decided I'd rather sketch with something that was going to dilute more into like a traditional watercolor. Uh, so that's why I'm using this. And also I thought with the color of the sky and also the color of the blue jeans that that cerulean blue would just be ideal for this job. There's a lot of foreshortening in this piece and by foreshortening it's when you don't see the full length of something because it's like facing you. So if you look at the legs, notice how we can see the um, the bottom part of the, the legs, like the shins, we can see those full length but we don't see the thighs full length. Um, so when you have situations like that, it can be very tricky. So what I try to do is I'll use negative space, I'll use a space around the subject, I'll use a space like between the feet, I'll use whatever I can to be kind of guide points. I'll line up the knee to the hand. I'll line up the elbow to the knee and I'll try to just get um, things in relation to each other because a foreshortening, if you're just looking at it, can be very confusing. So finding points of reference or like kind of like guideposts, just like you would if you were trying to follow directions on a map, that can help a lot when you're drawing. Now I'm just jumping in with some watercolors and I've got my M. Graham watercolors out. Now people often will ask me what's my favorite brand of watercolor and um, I think there's so many great brands. In fact, most professional brands are going to give you really good results and you should go with whatever professional brand is local to to you and the most uh, the best value I think but um, M Graham is a paint that's made in America it happened to be the first line of professional paints that I purchased when I was in my early 20s um, and they were new to the art supply store that I frequented so they were a great deal and I just fell in love with them and um, they're my favorites but I'm not saying they're the best watercolors in the world in fact I think there's so many good brands out there they just happen to be my favorites for you know the reasons that I'm so used to them they also have honey in them and they're very easy to rewet and um and I like them a lot. Now I don't tend to use them a lot on YouTube tutorials because usually they take up the palette takes up too much space on my table. So um, I tend to use smaller tins of watercolor just so I can zoom in on my painting more and you can still see my mixing area. But when I'm doing a 9 by 12 portrait size painting, I find it's uh it's easier to fit that whole palette on the on the table because to zoom out so that my full paper is on the table, I can also have that real estate to show the palette. Um, and also if I'm going to spend a lot more time on something or work on a larger painting. I like having the larger wells because I'll be using bigger brushes and it's kinder to your larger brushes to have a larger well, like either a full pan watercolor or a studio palette like this. Um, my preference is a studio palette. It's not that convenient for travel, but for painting at home, working large, you really can't beat it. This palette here is a Jones palette because I get asked this every time I use it, J-O-N-E-S, I believe, um, just like it sounds. And I think I paid probably around 
16 or 17 bucks for it. I bought it at the time I bought the paints. Um, but my recommendation would be, because this palette is kind of thin and flimsy, my recommendation would be to go for a John Pike palette or even the Stephen Quiller palette, which I believe the Stephen Quiller has a ceramic version. I'm not sure if, the, if his plastic palette is really high quality, but the Pike palette is a nice thick, almost like a um, like PVC pipe type material plastic that won't like um, get brittle and crack. This Jones palette, the cover has gotten brittle and cracked. I actually have it reinforced with duct tape. The bottom part seems fine because it's always has its cover on it. I think it's sunlight that tends to break down the these plastic palettes. So if you do have a plastic palette like this, I would recommend keeping a lid on it and keeping it out of direct sunlight just to keep it longer because you don't want to have to ditch all your paints because your palette's starting to break apart and flake away. And it is a drag, friends, if you ever have to dig paint out of a palette. It is a complete drag. So um, that would be my advice. Um, I would love to have a large ceramic palette someday, but currently I just don't have the real estate on my desk and um, I would hate to like knock it off and break it. You know, I've got smaller ceramic palettes that I like using, but um, one day it would be nice to have a big ceramic palette. But I think that would be in very, very, very much the future when I am doing more um, illustration work and less video filming work. So um, just something to think about. Your situation should really dictate what sort of paper and what sort of paints you go for. Like I said, if you live in Germany, you know, M. Graham paints, Daniel Smith paints, those paints are going to be so expensive for you out there. Go with something local um, because the quality isn't going to differ that much if you're going in the professional ranges. And if you can't afford professional watercolors, don't fret. There are a lot of good student grade brands out there. I review a lot of them on my channel because I'm always looking to find um, good value for beginners. Um, so, you know, just use what you have and when you're ready to upgrade, do a little research basically. So I've gone back and forth with uh, with watercolor. I'm going back in with the crayons now because one technique I really find fun is to go in with a crayon, a dry crayon over a wet paper because your marks are going to be really dark, really robust. They will stay. So even if you brush over them with water, a lot of those marks will stay. Now at this stage, I'm going to try my Stabilo 3-in-1 crayons. I know I ruffled a lot of feathers with my review of those um, a couple weeks ago, two two weeks ago, but I was honest, man. I, I think they're I think they're nice, but I think they're overpriced, quite frankly. But I did want to give them another go. I bought and paid for them. I'm going to use them by golly because I don't waste I don't waste money. Or if I do waste money, I make sure I use it so it doesn't go to waste. Um, and also, I do like how soft and opaque they are. And I know they will stick over top my crayon, my Caran d'Ache watercolor crayons. So I knew they would have no problem whatsoever st standing out on top of my American Journey watercolors, uh, watercolor sticks. So the there's I ha, I have kind of a watercolor crayon fetish I think because it's like I just I can't I can't resist them man I cannot resist a watercolor crayon <laughs> I think I have almost every different iteration of watercolor crayons but um, I like them all for different reasons I've got to say um, like I like the kids gel crayons because they're very very soft and they will lay over anything and they're very cheap and they're fun very expressive I like my Caran d'Ache love my Caran d'Ache watercolor crayons because they are for me the premium product I they're they're opaque they're like gouache in a stick they're very easy to use I feel like I get a really good um, result from them I like the set of cheap Joe's watercolor crayons now I'm going to tell you they are not cheap they are kind of pricey but they are uh, made with artist grade pigments and they are but they are more expensive than the neo color twos they're not opaque though they may be semi opaque on some colors but they're definitely more of like a stick of watercolor kind of like a cross between the daniel smith watercolor sticks which honestly are like a big long pan of paint and the caran d'ache neo color twos which are more of an opaque watercolor gouache like uh, pastel so they're kind of like a nice in between sketching medium. I don't find the Daniel Smith sticks to be sketching mediums. I find them to be great for slicing up and putting in full pans for use with travel palettes or even slicing them up and putting them in my new um, portable painter micro, um, the new divided pans for the micro. They fit perfectly in the double pans. Um, and they're cheaper ways to get Daniel Smith colors, in my opinion. And I think I think they're a really good value because I find Daniel Smith in general to be a little overpriced. But if you get the sticks, I find them to be a really nice, uh, a really nice value for the same paint. Then you don't have to wait for them to dry out because it's my preference to work from dry paint. That might not be your preference. We're all different people. We're all different artists. That's why I say um, do a little research before you choose your paints. Figure out what kind of painter you are. Find out what's the best value where you live because I could recommend something that's a steal of a deal here for me in America, but might cost you double in the country you're from and what might cost me double might be a steal of a deal where you're from. So, um, 
you know, definitely don't don't blindly follow a review. You got to look at the prices. That's what and that's what I think got me in trouble with the Woodies with some of you guys is that I can't divorce the price of those suckers from the quality of them. And yes, the the quality is good, but you know they're crayons marketed to children that cost $40 for a set of 18. And, you know, I can't pretend they cost $10. You know, I'm definitely going to review them differently um, if they cost more and explain why. Anyway, so I did get some grief about that review, but I think most people understood where I was coming from. And uh, and I don't hate the product. I'm going to use it. But I just think they're, they cost a little much. I on, Honestly, I think that the American Journey watercolor sticks are a little bit too pricey as well, but at least you know they're using the, I don't know who makes them. Da Vinci makes their watercolor paints, I understand, but um, I'm not sure about the uh, the sticks if da Vinci, da Vinci makes the watercolor sticks too, but um, but they work well. I like them and, uh, and they're fun to use. So, uh, so anyway, I wanted to put that, um, the kind of a uh, balcony, not balcony, what do I want to say, uh, railing behind the guitar player. I think it adds an interesting dimension. I like the linear quality and I think it adds some depth and perspective, especially with all the foreshortening we have. And the shadow, I think, is really what helped this um, this painting come to life. Having that strong shadow from his legs, I think that really, uh, that really works. Um, there's a guitar case. It's kind of obscuring my shadow on the other side of the, um, the bench he's on. And I think I need to push that shadow out a little bit further. I'll probably do that later because um, I didn't at the time of taking photographs of this, but it didn't kind of occur to me till I looked at it the next day. Actually, a lot of times something doesn't occur to me until I see a photo of the painting. Like I posted this on... Um on Instagram. That's where I'm posting all of my World Watercolor Month sketches and paintings. Um, and I didn't, it, as soon as I saw a photo of it, I'm like, oh darn, I it, I noticed I, that shadow needs to come out a little bit further. But um, but hey, taking a photo, that's a really great way to give yourself perspective on your painting. If you're not sure how it's looking, look at it in a mirror, like hold it up uh, to a mirror and look at its reflection. It'll show you a backwards version and things that, that, um, that are wrong will jump right out at you or give it a day or two, put it away, come back and look at it with fresh eyes and you'll see what's wrong. And oftentimes something that's bugging you and you're, not, and you're frustrated with your painting, after you give it a couple days, it will look better. And I always say it's like the, the painting fairies come and fix it. It's like the shoemakers, uh, the shoemakers elves, right? Uh, the, it's just, you give your, you give your brain a little perspective, a little time away because, um, and this is kind of interesting. And this is actually kind of ties in with a recent eye doctor appointment I just had. So I was debating whether I wanted to get, um, cause I'm 46, as I mentioned, the birthday sale, right? 46% off. Well, it's time in my life to get bifocals. I have found out. And the eye doctor said, you can either use the glasses you've always been using, but you could get reading glasses for close-up work. You could get um, bifocals or you could get progressives. And um, they said the progressives can take a while to get used to. They can make you feel kind of sick and dizzy for a while. I'm like, well, I don't want that. And plus they were like double the price. So I ended up getting bi ordering bifocals. I haven't got them yet. But... Um, but anyways, but the eye doctor was telling me that progressives, they take a while to get used to. And the reason is you see with your brain just as much as your eyes. And so your brain needs to get used to where to look through those lenses and how to kind of put that information back together in your head. And that's kind of what's happening here when you're painting and you make an error and you keep on keeping on with that error, your brain sees it as correct. Just like you don't have to put every detail in a painting and your brain will see it as detailed. Your brain will put in the, um, will put in the missing information. That's why you can look at an impressionistic painting and it looks gorgeous. You're looking at it from a distance. It looks gorgeous. Everything fits. You can, you're seeing this beautiful scene, but if you go up close and you put your face right next to it and you look at any part of that painting close up, it's going to be splotches and squiggles. You know, your brain We'll take the information and put it together. That's why leaving out some information if you're not exactly sure of what a detail would be. Um, and I struggled with the hands on this because there's not enough detail. Um, but if I tried to detail, and I couldn't really see the hands. Or the hands looked a little awkward, especially that back hand that's strumming. Um, I kept trying to want to put detail in there, but the, the picture looked awkward when I, when I zoomed in. So nothing I could do to make that look right. Um, so finally, I just ended up going loose with it and letting my brain put in the detail and that looked fine. So it's funny. It's funny how our brains just want to make sense of things. So as long as we suggest something in our painting, the viewer's brain will put it together and we'll add that detail. And the less detail you put, especially in like a portrait like this, um, that lets your viewer put themselves in the, the subject's shoes. And that way, um, and that was a tip that I got from a uh, class that I took from um, 
it was a painting figures in watercolor class and he was we'd get something really detailed or somebody would paint a beautiful painting with tons of detail and he'd, he'd be like you got to get rid of the detail you have to get rid of the detail because i cannot see myself in your painting and somebody that wants to buy your painting is not going to buy that painting because they can't see themselves in it or they can't see their kids in it they can't see their family in that painting so he was saying get rid of the detail unless you're doing a commissioned portrait and they're requesting that detail because you you limit the amount of um, connection your viewer can make with that painting essentially so um um, that kind of stuck with me. And and I like that. And I like that, you know, many people could see themselves in this painting and see the joy that he is having just sitting out in the sunshine playing a guitar. I mean, man, if that's not good, I don't know what it is. Sitting out at the beach playing your guitar. I mean, does it get better than that? Maybe sitting on the beach painting somebody playing a guitar. That would be maybe a little bit better for me since, you know, my guitar skills are lacking. But, you know, that's uh, if I don't know what's good, if I don't know... Uh, <laughs> if that's not good, I don't know what is, I guess, to quote Norman Lear, I think is a person that said that. But anyway, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's funny how our brains see as much as our eyes do. And you can see artists that are practically blind that can, that paint gorgeous things that we know what they are, um, because they've got the muscle memory of painting from when they could see well, and you know, they're seeing shapes, they're seeing the important stuff, they're getting the highlights, the shadows, the values, the gesture. And really, that's what you need. That's what you need in your painting. And my goal in this was to get expression because the prompt was perform. So I wanted that expression. I wanted that joy. I do feel like my paintings are lacking a little bit in, in the gesture. I love that, like the way that his body is a little twisted and his shoulders kind of coming forward a little bit slightly on the hand that's holding the cord on his guitar. And just like, it looks like he's laughing or singing. I just, I just love that. Um, and so that's what I really wanted to get there. I think I did okay, but, um, and, and I always are like at this stage of the painting, I'm like, oh, I wish I did a better drawing. I wish I drew it with a pencil on a separate piece of paper, refined it, got it perfect, then transferred it onto my good watercolor paper. But sometimes, you know, I just want to jump in. I just want to dive in and express myself with color. And that's kind of a little bit that you give up when you're doing that. But I will say the more that you draw and the more that you practice, the better you're going to get at that. So, I mean, I honestly, I don't like tedium. The fact of sitting down drawing something on copy paper and then uh, getting out my transfer paper and drawing, tracing over it again onto my watercolor paper, that can also lose a lot of life. It can lose a lot of the life and urgency and um, enjoy in your painting. So, you know, it's sometimes it's fun to do that. But a lot of times I find, especially if it's not, because I don't really do commissions, I'm doing I'm painting for my own pleasure. Um, I just want to jump in there and paint. So, you know, I guess you just got to do what you, what you like the best. Uh, but I do find when I get, if I'm going to spend a lot of time in a painting, when I get to the stage, I'm like, oh, I should have started with a better drawing, man. Why didn't I take more time with the drawing stage? But I did have fun in the drawing stage. And honestly, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. We lose that as we get older, guys. As we get older, I'm older. I'm a year older. I'm a year closer to death, guys. And, you know, you got to take that joy wherever you can find it. And if your joy is, you know, making marks on the paper, jumping in with color, do it. Paint like a child, right? Pablo Picasso said, every child is an artist. The problem is remembering that when you grow up. Now, see, I'm sticking my head in there so I could see those details. <laughs> uh, I still got my old glasses. Um, Ironically, because I have astigmatism, I'm seeing better without my glasses a lot of time for close-up than I am with them because of the shape of my eyeballs, says my doctor. But anyways, um, I'm just kind of fussing around here, fiddling a bit too much, adding a few more highlights to the boards, but I'm going to call this a day. And I got to say, I like how it turned out. It was a lot of fun and uh, it was fun to paint. I enjoy looking at it now and um, I hope you enjoyed this time lapse. And if you'd like a real-time version of this, you can find it right now in Critique Club over at lindsaywyrick.teachable.com. I'll have a link in the video description as well. As a coupon code, if you want to go grab some classes now, maybe do some painting, take the classes in the winter when the weather's all yucky and you're stuck inside, um, my full-length classes have lifetime access. So you buy one of my full-length classes uh, for one price and you have it forever, which is really nice. Um, there's payment plans available on those classes. And of course, Critique Club is a monthly membership class that you do have to pay every month um, as long as you want access. But um, I do have some compilations of the past years if you prefer that. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. Until next time, happy crafting!